<laughs> Hello and welcome to another episode of The Soul of Business with Blaine Bartlett. I'm your host, Blaine Bartlett. It's kind of interesting how that works. And my guest today, I am absolutely, you know, if you, if you could you know, see in, inside me, I'm, I'm flipping cartwheels. I'm, I'm back to being a 12-year-old kid flipping cartwheels here. Um, this young lady that I have as a guest is probably one of my dearest friends. I have known her since the mid-1970s. Um, we have got a history that is very intricate, very complex, uh, very generative is the word I would use. Uh, yeah, there are very few people in my life that I actually will call a mentor. And uh, Dr. Kara Barker, uh, Barker is, is, is uh, in that category for me. Um, she was... The, the first female boss I ever had in my life. And she absolutely turned upside down my sense of what it meant to be a quote unquote boss. Um, there was no command and control involved with it. It was all around influencing. And if, if those of you that are listening to the show uh, have heard me define leadership in this fashion before, it's the process of influencing others in order to co-create coordinated movement with the intent of producing a specific result. And there's three pieces to that, influencing, co-creation, and coordinated movement. And Kara has taught me probably more than anybody else what it means to be truly influential. Uh, and, and it's not through technique. It's through beingness, just being and being present. And through that being present, magic happens. And so... As long as I've known her, a magician is one of the labels that I would use to describe her. It's, she's a metaphysical <laughs> uh, magician. Uh, <laughs> and I'm just going to kind of go on this riff here. I, I'm just getting started. She's a Jungian psychoanalyst. Um, she's the author of a number of books. Uh, she's been working as a speaker, as a practitioner, Jungian practitioner, uh, just a mentor, a friend, a leader, an artist. She's got some unbelievable art that uh, you can see in the background right now as you're looking at this video uh, of the show. Um, Dr. Kara Barker, I want to welcome you to the show. I am so happy to be here. And I did research on you. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Well, <laughs> what did you find out that you didn't know? Oh, wow. Well, because we're talking about the feminine in corporate life, I, I chose 10 people, 10 women who are up there in corporate life. And I said, I want you to watch this podcast and I want you to tell me your take on it. And the universal conclusion was, I wish he were my boss. I wish he were on the board of directors, my board of directors. And it, and and the quality, Blaine, was the warmth, the allowingness, the listening, which is so important to women, the listening. Uh, so there you are. Well, uh, that's – I got chills thanking you, uh, both thinking about that, but also looking at a way to thank you effectively for that. Um, you know, I, I came across this quote um, yesterday uh, coming out of a meditation. I was doing some writing and I don't, I don't know who to attribute this to because it was unattributed. But the, the quote essentially said, silence is not the absence of noise. Silence is the absence of me. And isn't that just profound? It's very and Buddhist. Yeah, it is very Buddhist. And where I went to with that was what's the nature of presence? You know, what am I listening for? And it has to, you know, all of that has to do with who's the who that's listening. And this kind of goes back to, you know, some of the stuff that Michael Singer would talk about, I suppose, in the end. Yeah, who, who's the listener? Uh, but that idea of silence being a uh, an analog for presence. 
is something that I want to explore. And, and if we don't do it here in this conversation, that's something that I've written down that I want to unbundle a little bit. But silence being the analog uh, for presence. Yeah, uh, what does that kind of show up in your mind as when you hear that? A story, it, it really real stories um, that stop us in our tracks when there are no words that can be said to accommodate the the telling of one's real story because we're story makers. Mm -hmm. Well. Let me let me share with you a story to illustrate, okay? Okay. Okay. So, I mean, in a way, it brought me to you today. Not when we first met, but today. Um, so this was 32 years ago, living in Washington, D.C. I'm driving home, and it's the first day of spring. The sun is out. The cherry blossom trees, the daffodils, it was just gorgeous. And I stop, I've dropped my daughter off at school, and I, I stop in front of my home, and I hear this silent voice. And it says, stay here, memorize everything. Your life is about to change. And it was so eerie, my legs started to shake. But I did what it said. I went, it, now this, these things aren't rational, like the quote that you said. It's mm -hmm. not rational. Um, then I noticed this one yellow daffodil, the cherry blossom to the right of the stairs, and a robin building a nest in there. So... Everything's about to change. Okay. I go inside and I can't breathe. I look, this is in the days where there were answering machines and the red light is blinking and I'm just terrified to pick it up. I just, I know something really bad's happened. And I pick it up and my ex husband's voice is just quivering and my veins are frozen. And he says, our son has been in a very serious accident. He may die. And in that space of quietude, there was overwhelming blankness and blackness for me. When he told me that they wanted permission to take his organs, I, I just collapsed on the floor. Mm -hmm. And that experience, maybe the details are different from other people's, and I hope they are, but it's that time of we know we do not know what to do at all. Yeah. And everything is dark, and there's a forest ahead. And we don't know if we're coming or going. In fact, that's why I, I painted the, um, the cover of my book, what we hope for is that there's a light somewhere because we know we got to go into that forest. And, yeah. you know, okay, so when there a branch hits me and it goes, you don't know what you're doing in another branch, you don't know where you're going, and another one, what if you get lost? All those self-limiting thoughts that create the music in our head, and it's not pleasant music. But those things, in my experience, that have stopped me in my tracks, and they could also be glorious things, which did happen in the course of um, healing from that experience. For me, Blaine, it's always in quietude. Always. Yeah. yeah. You know, I that story you mentioned in your book behind you there, um, that, I know that story is in the book. Uh, I read the book. It's a, it's, it's a phenomenal piece. And what you're describing is actually the title of the book, Nightlight, My Soul Calling, My Body Listening, and Then My Heart Speaking. How do I know what to do when I don't know what to do? I have to get quiet first. Yeah. Listen, and, we're and then my heart will inform it. It will. Say but, that again. You know, yeah. I said, well, 
you know, when I look outside, like I'm on my walk this morning, everybody is rushing and pushing and stressing. And there, there was a woman pushing a stroller and she had a cup of Starbucks coffee in one hand and her phone like this. And the, and she was she was racing like a bat out of hell. And I thought this poor child is going to end up in therapy like, <laughs> you know, there was no way there was no way for that little one to bond with the mother. And yeah. we're afraid of silence because it looks empty and it's not. That's where the help is, is in the silence, in the connectedness. Yeah. In the connectedness. That's that's what we're looking at here. Um yeah, your journey has been an interesting one. And I and I and I say that just from the standpoint of just knowing you as well as I know you and for as long as I've known you. Um, but this is not where you envisioned yourself ending up. This is where you are right now. And, and what I mean ending up, <laughs> there's there's been some twists and turns. There's been a lot of force, a lot of movement, a lot of light that you've moved towards. Um, but you you were born in D.C., Washington, D.C. And, um, yeah, it was, it was interesting when I discovered this, but your dad was basically chief of staff for President Eisenhower. I mean, that would uh -huh. be my language for it, whether that's the correct title or not. Mm -hmm. But there's a background of, of nursing. Uh, there's mm -hmm. uh, the artistry. There's the uh, the writing. Um, I, your journey, when I, when I think about the soul of business, when I think about the soul of life, there's something about for you, and I mentioned that for you, you have been a mentor of mine in my life. Part of that mentoring has been watching you navigate life. <laughs> and the okay. perturbation that kind of that kind of shows up, it's kind of like, whoa, I guess I'm, you know, you know <laughs> that, that, that venue seems to be closing right now. What's the next opening? Mm -hmm. And that's always been a fascinating takeaway for me about you. So part of the question that I have here for this is, What's your earliest memory, if you have such a thing, of being so connected to that? That's and for me, soul. I mean, and, you know, Carl Jung is a great you know, uh, example of this. You know, I think he, and this is a paraphrase, but it's that 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 spark that enlivens anything, that gives life to anything, that gives brightness to anything. Now, that's a butchering of what I think he said. But when did you first tap into that? And how, Actually, and, and how have you translated that into your work? Um, I was really not as old as two. And I remember sitting in the crib and the leaded glass windows were open. It was springtime. And I heard the birds. And I didn't know what they were. And sister said, those are birds. And I just thought, oh, my God. That's fantastic. Nature. Nature is a big teacher for me. And mm -hmm. so, you know, you know, Blaine, like every part of creation has hardwired into it the urge to grow. Everything does. From yep. tadpoles to frogs to my tulips that were undercover for quite a while and now they're popping out. And we're hardwired to grow. And so that theme of nature really was actually, it was a place of solitude and it still is. I don't like to go on walks with other people. I don't want the chit chat. I know you don't. I know I want to go to a time where it's not too busy. And that's been an informant for me and it, metaphorically, but it's been so useful in work. I didn't really plug that into work. Well, when I was um, an army nurse during Vietnam and I saw the horrendous injuries of um, mostly men where half their face was blown off. And I thought, well, nature heals. I don't know how this is going to heal, but nature heals. So how mm -hmm. can I be not in the way of their healing. And the first patient that I went into, I used to get in trouble all the time because I stayed too long with patients. But 
yes. this <laughs> rabbi, priest, and minister <laughs> asked me to go with him on yeah. rounds. I just rabbi, to priest, and minister. Okay. There, there's going to be a and, bar joke here, right? <laughs> it's not like a joke, but there's no punchline. I just happened to be minding my own business in the mess hall, sitting next to them. They're talking about this soldier that wouldn't talk. So the the priest says to me, would you mind going with us in that we're all male? Yeah, that's true. Okay, I will. So I go in there and this guy lost his leg and both of his arms and he was a surgeon. Oh. And he wasn't, he wasn't talking. So I got out my little sketch pad, which I always carry in my, in my pocket in my trusty Bic pen with four colors. And I said, um, I know it's uncomfortable for you to talk, and that's okay. Would you mind if I just sat with you? You can shake your head, and that'll tell me. He goes, he indicates it's okay if I sit there. So I said, okay, I'm not going to pressure you to talk. Do you mind if I just doodle on my sketch pad? And he nodded yes. So I did. And at the end, about 40 minutes later, he says to me, do you mind if I see it? And that was the first time he spoke. He wanted to know how his story was reflecting to the witness. And that's when I learned, my God, you know, we have stories in us that are just bursting to be told. And to be heard and seen and held and respected. I think what gets, what's difficult for women in the corporate life. Now I'm kind of tangenting out here. Um, oh, <laughs> I'll tell you a story. <laughs> okay. All right. I'm getting out of the shower. My son is about two and a half. So I'm butt naked. And he looks at me and he starts crying. I said, Matt, what's wrong? And he says, mommy, you don't have a pee pee. <laughs> <laughs> I can hear Matt saying that. <laughs> oh, yeah. uh, and it's in a way kind of Freudian, but there's that, uh, there's so much, um, you know, even in holy works, it's always he, 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 him. There's mm -hmm. this assumption that the feminine is behind and lacking in some way. Yeah. So the women that I've worked with in corporate life, uh, in fact, I wrote about this in, uh, it was published, unfortunately, the month after 911, um, called World Weary Woman, Her Wound and Transformation. I wanted to know what was pushing women in corporate life to succeed. And what I thought it would be like parental expectations, it wasn't that. It was, and it took me many years afterwards, because I keep interviewing women, up to about just under 500 women now. It's absence, absence in some way where the parent died or was in the war or was, in, was hospitalized or left the family, but that absence. So these women were very intimidated in mainly a male-run corporation. Because the mm -hmm. feminine works in a very different way from the masculine. And I'm not talking about gender, because we all have feminine, we all have masculine. It just right. works in a different way. And it requires space and quiet. Yeah. Yeah. So the absence of space, the ab you know, it's interesting, the absence of the language of being rather than a reliance on the language of doing. And, yeah. you know, the, the idea. There, there, there's you know some some linguistic distinctions that I think you know you know language creates and it also reflects reality, and that's one of the other things I've been playing with lately is just what are some of the distinctions between language of doing and language of being, and which actually is the more powerful in in sustaining life, sustaining longevity, you know, success in life, mm -hmm. and you said something just a minute ago that I um, I mean it just kind of sat up. Um, you know, we're talking about the soldier and your, your internal question was, how can I not get in the way of his healing? Mm -hmm. How can I not get in the way of his healing? 
which is mm-hmm. different than, and that's, and that's a question of being rather than a question of doing. It's a, it's a question of allowing the healing to emerge rather than trying to impose something on top of it that I think is the prosthetic uh, cure here. Is that an ac- accurate assessment of what was kind of you know, running there? It's very accurate because the doing in that situation in a burn unit is debriding, where you have to take away <laughs> the most recently developed skin so that oxygen can get in. And it's hideous. I can't even imagine how painful it is. And I thought, there's there's been doing this. I wasn't calling that in my mind, but so many maneuvers. And, uh, uh, and I thought, just sit quietly. Yeah. Yeah. Body listening, heart speaking. And on that, mm-hmm. body listening, heart speaking. I want to take a quick break. I want to come back in and I want to jump into the book. Because you know, I, I, I was fortunate enough to get a, a pre-publication copy of it, and I absolutely fell in love with this book. Uh, so I want to uh, be a, a, <laughs> a shameless shill here and really promote this on the back side of this, because it, it's, it's an extraordinary book, folks. It really is. It's an absolutely seminal piece of work. And we're going to uh, kind of unbundle that here in just a moment. So we're going to take a real quick break. Good enough. Today's guest, Dr. Kara Barker, and we will be right back after this short message. The nature of life is evidenced in nature. Nature grows, and all of nature honors the desire to be more, to have more, and to do more. Life thrives when it's allowed to grow, and ideally thriving is what we also, all of us, want to be able to do. Unfortunately, at some stage in life, Most people find themselves settling into what I can only call a rut. And a rut is nothing more than a coffin with the ends kicked out. You want to quickly get out of any rut that you find yourself in. When you stop growing, that's when the coffin starts to appear. You know, the simple truth is this, and this is true for everything in nature. You're going to die. I'm going to die. Every one of us dies. So the question we need to come to grips with is not, are we going to die? The question nature asks us to answer is, are we truly living? That's what motivation is about. It's the desire to move. It's the desire to grow and to excel. Have I lived? How have I lived? I'd love for you to take advantage of my Leadership Mindset Masterclass. It's all about providing you with the tools to ensure thriving for yourself and for those around you. Register today to receive the free introduction video and find out more about this acclaimed program. You'll also receive a copy of my international number one bestseller, Compassionate Capitalism, A Journey to the Soul of Business. I'm Blaine Bartlett, and I look forward to helping you thrive. Welcome back, folks. Um, speaking with Dr. Kara Barker, uh, and I very rarely, if ever, have used that full label here, Dr. Kara Barker. Um, but I want to emphasize the doctor here. As a Jungian analyst, uh, I mean, she studied in Geneva, and the depth of her work uh, at the Jungian Institute, and the depth of her work is profound. Um, and I've been fortunate enough to, to sit along and talk much with her over the years. And she's, like I mentioned at the beginning here, she's written a number of books, uh, but she asked me to take a look at um, the latest one that she wrote, a pre-publication copy of it, and it's called Night Light, My Soul Calling, Body Listening, Heart Speaking. And it was one of those reads where I sat down going, well, I'll just skim this and kind of get through it and kind of you know, pull out the high points. I got into the first chapter and I was stuck. And I mean stuck in the sense of, this was not going to be something that I was going to flip through. It was kind of like, okay, I can see four o'clock in the morning coming up real quickly here as I'm you know, steeping, literally steeping in this book. I mean, it was a phenomenal read. It was funny. It's articulate. Um, but what I was most impressed with was the use of story to illustrate what are universal human conditions. And not only the story to illuminate them, but also in the metaphor that you used about the forest and the, and the light, you know, there's a light out there. 
in the in the illustration of it, pointing away towards uh, I mean, what I I don't think it's an over exaggeration to call redemption in 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 many cases when we're in the dark night of yeah in the, yeah uh, Eckhart told yeah. Uh, the dark night of the soul. It's not the dark night of the soul. It's the dark night of the ego when my ego is collapsing. And bingo, Bing, which is a death. The soul, but the soul is light. Yeah, it's so the, I collapse the collapse the ego, and all of a sudden, yeah, silence is the absence of me, and I can hear something else. So, w- mm-hmm. what compelled the book? Uh, first of all, I'll just start with that question. What compelled you to write this one? Okay, truth time. So I'm on my walk, (laughs) and all my grandparents were dead by the time I was born. And I hear my paternal grandmother's voice. Now, how could I? It wasn't audio. And she said, write our story for the women in our line. What? What? Huh? Now, I'd had (laughs) dreams about her that were pretty interesting and did research into the dreams on her. But it started to haunt me. I I was thinking, you know, the the sand in the hourglass is dropping down. Mm -hmm. So what do I want my daughter and my granddaughter and those that follow? what What do I want them to know about a woman's journey? And then it expanded from that. And people were saying, oh, you, I wish you would put that. Da, 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 da. Um, it, and, it, oh, it was right before COVID. And uh-huh. COVID really served me as an introvert. So I sat my fanny down and I started to write. Like David White told me one time, the first year I write, the second year I throw it away, and the third year I write the book. That's what it was like. Uh huh. There were so many stories that I had to cut out, actually. And as it is, it's a long book. But when I was finished, I felt like I'd run my race. And that came from uh, seeing my son nine months before he was killed, uh, being the third youngest in a Goodwill Games marathon. And when he came around the corner to the University of Washington, where the finish line was, this thought went through my mind, Matt's run his race. I knew he was finished with what he came here to do. That haunted me. And I thought, if I don't write this, and partly because he asked me to write a book with him, then I'm not complete. And I want to be complete every day because I don't know when my tab will be pulled off the shelf. So I want it to be a day of life and kindness, and laughter, and joy, beingness. Mm. Yeah. You know, um, I was absolutely blessed to know Matt. Um, and I remember, yeah, this little tyke just wandering, you know, I mean, holding his hand, walking into, you know, we would have morning meetings, you know, when, when I was working for you. Uh, we would have... <laughs> 6 a.m. morning meetings, uh, you know, that kind of thing. But I remember, and, and I, don't, I don't know if he actually said this to me or not, but I think it was you that related what he said. But it had to do with a frosty day outside. And, and he said, you know, people are kind of like the grass that's covered with frost. And, and and you said to him, what do you mean by that? And he says, well, they got this hard shell around them, but it's really nice and you know, and green and alive he inside. Said that. Yeah, he, he did said say that. that. And I, I mean, I, I just... When I heard that, it, it just, I lit up. It was like, this is truth being spoken by a four-year-old. Um, mm-hmm. And I think he was about four at that point in time. Yeah, he um, was. He was. But how was he a teacher for you? How <laughs> wasn't he? Uh <laughs> Because I, I and, I, and I'm asking well, this question here very specifically, folks, because most parents see themselves as, Teachers for their for their kids, and, and justifiably so they are. But that listening, 
gets cut off when I'm in the role of telling my kids what to do. And as a consequence, I kind of stunt some, some, some things for them. Yeah. Matt was never stunted. That was never my experience of him. He was just this whoa, fountain of aliveness. As a teacher, how did he work that magic with you and through you? Well, first, when he was born, he almost died the first two days. So, so there was no cry when he was born. The cord was around his neck three times. So I thought, okay, took him home in his little, his little mini body. And I thought, this, every day I have with him is a blessing. Every day, because it might not have been. So... I noticed what he liked and I tried to support him toward that. I didn't ask, what do you want to do when you grow up? I went, what do you love the most today? And then he would tell me, and then we would elaborate on that. And what was the ick of today? And he would tell me. And though, so we would talk about that, how to digest the ick and turn it into something fruitful. <laughs> he was constantly, Fru fruity, yeah. constantly giving me lessons. Huh? He was prophetic. Fruity ick. Yeah. Fruity ick. Yeah. Fruity ick. That's right. Uh, you know, watching him when uh, his dad and I got a divorce, you know, watching how he attended to that, he said to me one day, you know, Mom, a lot of my friends' parents are divorced, but I'm lucky because I get two dads. He had a way of framing things that was really valuable. And I asked him one time, uh, this was in the, the year before he died. I said, Matt, what's been the most important thing about to you of me being your mother? And he said, when you saw me, you always smiled. I think a smile yeah. is an invitation. And as a woman, yeah. when we go into corporate America, there aren't a lot of smiles. That so women, true. they become like, I call them manized women, or Jung would say anima women, masculine. And I used to do it. I used to wear the three-piece suit, the burgundy tie, the, <laughs> the briefcase. And I, but when I was doing corporate subcontract work, I didn't feel like myself at all. Yeah. And I recognized... <laughs> I'm like them. And I thought, I have to, I have to dress the way I, I have to move when, I, when I'm working. Uh, now, Matt said to me one day, Mom, could you not wear your gypsy clothes to the PTA tonight? I said, what? He said, could you wear the clothes the other mommies do? I was like, oh, dear. <laughs> you know, he gave feedback. He did give me feedback, and I paid attention to it. I, I I have so many gorgeous memories of him, including the last time he hugged me. Mm, I would yeah. lean into that a lot during that first year. Sometimes now. Yeah. yeah. He taught me what was important. That's beautiful. I love that. And when we're looking at soul, you know, and this is, I mean, the short time that I was with Matt, and I remember having him over at the house that we, that you know, you and I shared together uh, in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. um, and, and there's a whole backstory to that. Um, but we had this beautiful place in Pacific Heights uh, overlooking San Francisco Bay. And I remember Matt coming. Hey, um, mm-hmm. And and I and it was I think uh, he was a teenager at that point, but it, it was just being able to sit with him and talk and 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 being struck by the wisdom that was being spoken by this 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 youngster, yeah, this youngster, and and it quickly changed my sense of what it meant to be relating to a human being. Yeah. And one of the things that I, you know, that I took away with, you know, from Matt, and this was also true for you in my relationship with you. And it's something that I look at when I'm looking at working with the leaders that I work with in organizations. Yeah. How do people feel about themselves when they're in your presence? And when I was in the presence of Matt, I, I felt seen, I felt heard, I felt playful. Yeah. He brought out playfulness just 
just by yeah taking a breath. He brought out playfulness. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's been something that I've experienced with you as well, and not just in a personal uh, context here, but people that I've seen you interact with. Um, one of the discerning modalities, I guess, would be the language that I'd use here, that I would assume that you kind of subliminally come, you know, tune into whether it's conscious or not, is how do people feel about themselves as we're doing this interaction? And if they're not feeling alive, if they're not feeling at least they have access to aliveness, all bets are off and we need to do something to get out of the way so that that aliveness can come through. That's so true. And when I talk to corporate women, I, you know, they're talking about their job and I say, well, wait a minute, what brings you to life? What makes you happiest? What are you doing when you're all alone? What is it? And finding that that thing, because we ask children, what do you want to be when you grow up? They don't know. I didn't know. I hadn't a clue. This is so I far from what I thought when I was a kid. But what do you love the most? Yeah. And then we worked that into their uh, mission statement or whatever the corporation called it. So they felt permission to bring that to the table. Mm -hmm. See, Simple that's the ways. Of, yeah, th that's the language of being. It is. I mean, these questions of beingness mm -hmm. uh, that people are not used to hearing, particularly in a workplace. Yeah, I was, I was uh, in a conversation with a fellow that's uh, uh, a client uh, not too long ago, and uh, he's got a small team that he's working with. He's got a couple of different companies that he's actually uh, uh, leading and managing. And he was wrestling with how do I get these guys, you know, kind of comfortable enough to start making decisions on their own without having me to, you know, direct all of the time. And it was, for me, it was a simple fix. Instead of, you know, having a, a, a weekly meeting about how are we doing? Are we hitting our numbers? What's our numbers? Where are we at with that? Have a meeting about, uh, who, you know, how are we being with each other? Not how are we doing with each other? Mm -hmm. And it was like a light bulb went off uh, for him. He went, oh, my God. And so that, that's going to be something that they're going to start instituting in this organization now. And uh, it's, I, I'm good. very eager to hear how this is going. Yeah. As he starts to I, unroll I want this. I know how it's going too. Yeah. I'd yeah, love to know I'll, how it's I'll going. Keep you you know, <laughs> since we're in the land of techie with Amazon and Google and Microsoft, I get a number of clients from there, although my practice is international. And this one guy had been through a number of interviews. He'd actually worked there and then quit to do something else, very visionary, and then went back. So he's going through these layers of interviews. And he was just getting frozen. He says, because they ask you questions, the questions they ask you are so, they seem so random and whatever. And I just freeze. And I said, so what question do you ask? He said, me? I, I didn't know I could ask a question. I said, of course you can. What would you want to know? He said, where are they happiest outside of work? So they brought him back for another round and he asked that and the, and the interviewer just laughed, gave him the answer and he got the job. I think it's that expression, I'm interested in you. The, the, the interview is just a tool to get to know yeah. one another, to see if there's a fit. Yep. Well, I remember my first meeting with you and there was a fit. And it was kind of like, I don't know what this is going to go, but uh, I'm in. <laughs> I'm in. <laughs> Away we went. <laughs> um, Kara, how, how can folks find out more about what you're doing? I, they can get the book, Nightlight, My Soul Calling, Body Listening, Heart Speaking, on, on Amazon, I'm assuming. <laughs> yeah. Uh, they Well, they can go to my website, carabarker.com, C-A-R-A, barker.com. Um, they could email me. Now, I've been warned, don't ever do this, but I'm going to do it. My email is dr.carabarker at gmail.com. And whatever you would think would be useful, I would love to hear that because I know every person that's joining us today has a story and a question. 
and how to get out of do, be, have, which is a masculine model, to be, do, have, starting mm -hmm. with the silent voice. Yep. Very beautiful. I love it. Folks, Dr. Kara Barker, uh, one of the best friends that you will ever have in your life, and I say that from mm -hmm. experience. Uh, take some time to find out more about her. Um, she is a speaker, so if you've got something that you want uh, to put together and topically uh, you think she might be a fit, absolutely feel free to reach out to her. She is an extraordinarily entertaining and uh, wise presenter of, of some fascinating information. Uh, so, Kara, thank you for joining me. This has been, oh. I mean... <laughs> I, I, I mean, I could keep keep talking, but I know I've got a time limit on this thing, so I'm frustrated. But <laughs> okay, well, I'll, I'll probably you. have you back at some point in time here. Okay, I love it. <laughs> okay, take good care. Okay, folks, bye bye. You bet, yeah, folks. You've been listening to the School of Business with Blaine Bartlett. This is Blaine Bartlett, and um, go to my website. We've got stuff up there, uh, blainebartlett.com. But more than anything else, find ways to find uh, yourself in positions to be a center of distribution, not a center of accumulation. When you're giving things away, when you're distributing who you are, life works and it works magically well. Until next time, take care. Mm -hmm.